In this lecture, let's continue to work with Maxwell relations, but for the Gibbs free energy. So here is our definition of the Gibbs free energy. G is equal to U minus TS plus PV. When I take a full differential of the Gibbs free energy, I get DU minus TDS minus SDT plus PDV plus VDP. I make my usual first and second law substitution. The DU is equal to TDS minus PDV, in which case I get DG is equal to minus SDT plus VDP. So this TDS term cancels this minus TDS term. This minus PDV term cancels this plus PDV term. These are the only two terms that survive. We compare now with the formal differential, the simple calculus differential of G with respect to temperature and pressure, and it's partial G, partial T, DT, partial G, partial P, DP. And once more, there's a relationship here that partial G, partial T is negative the entropy, and partial G, partial P is positive volume. So here are the coefficients then expressed as differentials or as measurable properties or knowable properties. Entropy is hard to measure, but we have ways to relate it to other things. And so here is our uh, friend James Clerk Maxwell again. And uh, really this slide looks very similar to that for the Helmholtz free energy that we worked with. The difference is really only in the letters that are appearing in our equations. So we want to equate cross derivatives and so here are our initial derivatives. We now differentiate again with respect to the other variable and set the two equal to one another. And when that happens, given that this is the derivative of free energy with respect to pressure, I should now take its differential with respect to temperature. I get partial V, partial T. Given that the derivative of G with respect to T is minus S, I take its derivative with respect to pressure partial S, partial P, that's all negative. These two must be equal to one another. And so this is another of many possible Maxwell relations. Once more, notice that there is one quantity in here, entropy, for which I do not have a convenient meter, but the other quantities are things that I can readily go into a laboratory and measure. <coughs> and so if I choose to exploit this uh, Maxwell relation, I am likely to try to isolate the entropy and see how the entropy changes with pressure given an equation of state, that is a relationship between P, V, and T. And my mechanism will be that I will integrate at constant temperature this quantity times dP integrated from an initial pressure to a final pressure. And I've moved the negative sign from this side over to the other because I'll have entropy being positive on the left. So I'm holding temperature constant while I'm integrating over pressure. And I get this pressure dependence of uh, entropy then simply from knowledge of PVT data, equation of state data. Once more, it's always convenient to work with an ideal gas. And so for an ideal gas, volume is equal to nRT over P. So taking the derivative with respect to temperature is trivial. I just get nR over P. That means my integral has the constants taken out front. It's dP over P. And I'll end up with minus nR log final pressure divided by initial pressure, P2 over P1, isothermal. Again, I want to typically start from an entropy that I can perhaps get from a partition function because I am so low a pressure that my gas behaves ideally. And so I integrate from an ideal pressure as pressure goes to zero to some final pressure P2. And here is my same example, ethane at 400 Kelvin. So this is exactly the same value that I had uh, on, a, on uh, a slide from the last lecture where obviously as pressure goes to zero, volume goes infinite, density goes to zero. So it's all the same number minus, sorry, excuse me, positive 246.45 joules per mole Kelvin. And as I increase the pressure, the entropy goes down. And so this plot looks rather similar to what was plotted against density, because naturally density does, in fact, go up as pressure goes up. But uh, the numbers are different. These are values of bar. But qualitatively, 
entropy decreases. And so I'm getting entropy data from knowledge of volume, temperature, and pressure variations. Now, what about the enthalpy dependence on P? So when we worked with Helmholtz free energy, we had a convenient way to measure the internal energy. With Gibbs free energy, we have a way to measure the enthalpy. So if I differentiate G, which is H minus TS, with respect to the pressure, I get partial G partial P is equal to the pressure dependence of the enthalpy minus T partial S partial P. Again, I'll use my Maxwell relation to get rid of the entropy thing that I don't really know how to use a meter for, but I do know how to get volume temperature relationships. I already know that partial G partial P is equal to volume, so I can rearrange solving for the pressure dependence of the enthalpy, and it's equal to V minus T partial V partial T. And here's the sort of data I might derive from using uh, experimental equation of state data. Here's ethane once more at 400 Kelvin. Here's my ideal enthalpy, which I can get from a partition function, 17.87 kilojoules per mole. And then here's the behavior as I integrate. And notice this one is maybe, oh, it's less easy to come up with a, a simple intuitive explanation for why the enthalpy behaves this way. There's a balance of PV and internal energy. It goes down for a while, and then it flattens, and then it actually seems to be rising again at very, very high pressures. And for a real gas where we don't have a simple equation of state, like the ideal gas equation of state, then we really have to uh, look up these sorts of uh, volume temperature pressure relationships have to have done the experiments. Of course, once they're available, they're available for all time. Well, uh, let me take a moment here, actually, and let you work with this equation for a uh, equation of state that looks similar to some we worked with back when we did consider real gases. Okay, let's now look at the pressure dependence of the Gibbs free energy. So I know that that's the volume. I can integrate delta G from an initial to a final pressure, VDP. And as always, it's good to do the ideal gas first because it ought to conform to our now you know, familiarity with ideal gas properties. So I have that V is equal to nRT over P. And as a result, when I pull out the constants, this is isothermal, so T is a constant, I get the integral from P1 to P2, dP over P. That gives me the logarithm at constant temperature. And I want to compare this to a prior result for the ideal gas, namely delta S. So delta S is nR log V2 over V1. But for an ideal gas, what's V2 over V1? Well, P times V is a constant for an ideal gas at a given temperature. And so V2 over V1 is equal to P1 over P2 because they're inversely related, but I want to put P2 over P1, so I'll just change the sign of the logarithm when I flip the fraction. So I'll get that delta S is minus nR log P2 over P1. So the relationship between delta S and delta G is, again, they are related by multiplication by minus T. So we get delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S and since it's also equal to minus T delta S, that implies that delta H must be zero. And once more, our familiarity with an ideal gas says naturally, because we worked out that the enthalpy of an ideal gas depends only on the temperature. And since the temperature is being held constant, delta H must be zero. And delta G must be equal to minus T delta S. Well, that uh, finishes up what I want to do with Maxwell relationships. What I want to look at next is actually a very practical uh, example of applying all the thermodynamic principles that we have developed and armed ourselves with, the tools. So I think we began the course talking about building a lot of tools so that we could eventually build a house. Well, I think we're ready to look at a house of sorts. And in particular, I want to look at well, it doesn't look much like a house, but a rubber band. So I would like to take a look at and analyze the behavior of a rubber band, and we will do that from a standpoint of thermodynamics. So first, we'll look at a demonstration video of the behavior of a rubber band as temperature changes, and then we'll work out the thermodynamics behind it. 
Here's a nice practical test of your ability to explain something using thermodynamics. Here, I have a rubber band, and through its tension, it's supporting some of the mass of a weight that otherwise rests on this scale. We can quantify the tension at any instant by comparing the reading on the scale to the unsupported mass of the weight. Here, I have an incandescent lamp, which can serve as a heat source. Now, for the practical question. If I heat up the rubber band, will it contract and pull harder on the weight, thereby reducing its apparent mass? Or will it lengthen and increase the apparent mass resting on the scale? What do you think? And why do you think it? I'll let you ponder for a moment. Well, if you're just not sure, or even if you are sure, I think we have to do the experiment, no? So, let's heat up this rubber band. Look at the scale. Do you see how the apparent weight is decreasing, which is to say the tension in the rubber band is increasing? Thus the rubber band is contracting as it gets hotter. Is that what you predicted? Let me offer a general explanation for this behavior. A rubber band is composed of a number of long polymer chains. Each of the single bonds between two carbon atoms in those chains can in principle rotate so that the chain is locally either straight or bent. There are many ways to rotate so that the chain bends. But there's only one way to rotate so that the chain is straight and maximally extended. Thus, entropy favors shorter, bent chains, and there is much less disorder when chains are straight. So, when are chains more straight? When the rubber band is stretched, so that chains must achieve longer lengths. When we heat the rubber band by increasing the temperature, we favor the free energy of structures having more entropy, which is to say that at equilibrium, we favor shorter chains over longer, and the rubber band contracts as a result. You can try a different experiment at home. Take a rubber band, ideally a somewhat larger one, and touch it to your upper lip. It ought to be room temperature, and you won't feel much of anything at all. But now stretch it to much greater length suddenly, and touch it to your upper lip again immediately. It should feel warmer than room temperature. A more detailed analysis is required to explain this behavior, although the entropy change we've just discussed continues to be part of the analysis. And should time permit, we'll explore that process in more detail.